Our Zoning and Development Committee is meeting tonight to discuss the Lincoln Property Company proposal at 4600 North Marine Drive. But before we start, I want to provide some feedback we got from many members of this committee. Every member who contacted us said the meeting in April went on too long with repeated questions. So to respect everyone's time, I ask that you try not to repeat questions that were already asked. Uh, we will be sticking to a timeline so that we can be more respectful of all of you who so generously have given your time to attend tonight's meeting. Also wanna give a brief synopsis of what was discussed at our last meeting. Uh, regarding the possible sale of Weiss due to the sale of this parking lot, um, <clears throat> I'll say this, if Pipeline ever in the future made a decision to sell Weiss Hospital to an entity that is not a hospital system, they would have to go back to the community, uh, the city council, the plan commission for support. I would not support a change in its medical use. I also believe the plan commission, the city's zoning committee, a city council, and the mayor would all fight for this. Uh, Pipeline's other hospitals that were sold were not located in Chicago, and the city's process has many more safeguards in place to protect this property to make sure it remains used for medical pur purposes. Um, there are also questions about why Lincoln Properties already submitted their application to amend the plan development. They decided to do this so CDOT and other departments could start the review process, in, um, including the, the survey for traffic. Until the Department of Planning receives an official application, they cannot begin the review process. Additionally, the application is automatically placed on the zoning committee's agenda, but these items are always tabled until the plan commission reviews the project. Uh, the project is currently not on the plan commission agenda. If I don't approve this proposal, I will make the request to stop the city's review process and take this proposal off of the city's zoning committee agenda. Unfortunately, the staff from the Department of Housing misspoke at our last meeting. The Department of Housing uh, afterwards provided me with a letter that discussed the in lieu payment of $3 million to Sarah Circle to comply with the city's affordable requirement ordinance. The department stated that they are in full support of this contribution and would prefer this arrangement over trying to secure funding elsewhere. Given our desperate need for more affordable housing, the 46th Ward, for our most vulnerable residents, uh, people earning less than 15% of the area median income, including those folks living on the streets, this in lieu contribution is critically important for the Sarah's Circle project. And it frees up other affordable housing opportunity funds to be used to build more rather than less affordable housing in our ward. Uh, before Lincoln Property Company presents to the committee and our residents, I will pass it over to Tressa, my chief of staff, for the roll call. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm going to go through the, uh, the list and just please say out loud that you're here when I call um, your organization uh, or your name. 3600 North Lakeshore Drive, Doug Smith. Here. Smith, sorry. Thank you. Uh, 3660 North Lakeshore Drive, Mary Sentikar. 
700 West Bittersweet, Alice Lee. Here. Thank you. 828 Grace, Patrick Nagel. I'm here, Tressa, thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, Beacon Block Club, Stuart Berman. Uh, present. Thank you. When a Park Neighbors, Alex Walking. Here. Thank you, Alex. Clarina Park Neighbors, Jackson Morsey. Here. Thank you. Clark Street Block Club, Alan Dubois. Uh, Dubois, and I'm here. Dubois, thank you. <laughs> I wasn't sure. <laughs> uh, Historic Structures, Martin Tangora. Here. Thank you, Marty. Lakeside Area Neighbors Association, Marianne Lalonde. We're here. Thank you, Marianne. Lakeview East Chamber of Commerce, Maureen Martino. Is Maureen here? Okay. Um, Magnolia Malden, Kathy Cook. Kathy Cook. Real estate, Mark Zipper. Here. Thank you. Okay. UCC Patrick Waters. Present. Thank you. Uh, Truman Square Neighbors, Betsy Lent. I'm here, Tressa. Thank you, Betsy. Okay. Friendly Towers, Glenn Van Alkamid. Here I am. Thank you, Glenn. North Halstead Business Alliance, Lake Allen. Present. Thank you. Okay. 4250 North Marine Drive, Robert Salm. Here. Thank you. Um, 4300 North Marine, Michael Waltz. Here. Thank you. Okay. 4848 North Sheridan, Stuart Hatch. Is Stuart here? Okay. 655 West Irving Park, Susie Hunter. Here. Hi, Susie. Good evening. 850 Eastwood, Regina. Is Regina here? Ainsley Wilmore Black Club, Brian Beezer. Is Brian here? Okay. Um, Castlewood Terrace, Ed Kusky. Ed here? Okay. Uh, Dover Street Neighbors, Scott Adams. Scott. Okay. Um, but Tasha, one moment. I, I think Scott is on here. I'm just gonna ask to unmute. Okay. Press uh, Scott, the bottom left hand corner of the screen to unmute. Okay. Okay. I think he's just having tech issues. That's I fine. I'll, I'll move on. That's okay. East Lake you neighbors, Michael Zink. Hey, Teresa. I'm here. Hi. Okay. Uh, Grayson Wilson neighbors, Jason DeVore. I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Um, Nuna Black Club, Maria. Right here. Thank you. And one more side, Chris White. Present. Thank you, Chris. Uh, retail, Luke Sauer. Is Luke Present. Thank you. 
Recording in progress. In progress. Okay, uh, Uptown United, Martin Sorge. Good evening. Thank you, Martin. And uh, let's see, um, nonprofits and entertainment, Jackie Taylor. I am here. Thank you, Jackie. Mm -hmm. Uh, 3950 North Lakeshore Drive, Anna Brolovsky. Here. Thank you, Anna. Let's see, 3750 North Lakeshore Drive, Bill Cartwright. Here. Thank you, Bill. And um, affordable housing, Tony Mills. Tony, are you on? Okay. Uh, Voice of the People, Michael Rohrbach. I'm here. Thank you. Okay. We are all set. Thank you, Tressa. I will now give the floor to Lincoln Property Company to present their proposal. Joe, if you're talking, Joe? we do not hear you, just yeah. so you know. Joe Segabiano was going to start off. Yeah, Joe, are you on? Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Yes. All right. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so first of all, Alderman, thank you for your time this evening, and thank you to all the committee members for reconvening this evening. Um, we will be respectful of your time, so what we'd like to first do is to hand the mic off to Irene Dumanis, who is the CEO of Weiss Hospital. Uh, to make a short statement. And then after that, the LPC team will provide a brief overview of some of the changes and of the process. So with that, I will hand it over to Irene. Thank you, Joe. Can you, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Okay. I see a lot of thumbs up. Good evening. Um, most of you know me. I'm Irene Demanis. I'm the CEO of Weiss Hospital. And again, I'm pleased to be here with you tonight. Um, I previously spoke um, and addressed this group at the April 29th meeting. I also spoke on several um, occasions at the LANA meeting as well. So I'm not going to take too much of your time today. I just wanted to take this opportunity to make a couple of points. Um, the approval of this application is very important to Weiss Hospital as it will allow us to sell this surplus lot that um, we no longer need and invest all of the proceeds to expand and improve the medical services Weiss provides to this community. Um, we have obtained about 199 letters of support from our neighbors by reaching out to various community groups and uh, people that utilize this hospital on a daily basis. Um, and would like to see um, us to continue and expand services that we provide to our community. Um, also wanted to touch on another point, there continue to be um, untrue and unfounded statements made that Weiss is planning to close. There is no plan to close Weiss Hospital. I'm gonna say it again, there is no plan to close Weiss Hospital. On the contrary, we're investing. We just started a construction on a brand new orthopedic unit, just brought in new robotic equipment. So we're growing, but I cannot stop others from making these statements. So I wanted, to hear, wanted this group to hear it from me again. There are no plans to close Weiss Hospital. If you want to support Weiss Hospital, then I would ask you to vote for this application um, tonight and, and help us continue to grow and provide services to this diverse community. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Um, so since the, the last time we met, which was on April 28th, we have met with Lana on May 13th and again on June 3rd. Uh, in between those meetings on May 18th, we provided seven pages of answers to Lana about the project. Um, since we first met with the Alderman on January 6th of 2020, we have made the following changes based on requests from the D DPD, DOH, Uptown United, the Alderman's office, and, and Lana. Um, so I'll quickly run through those. We reduced the overall building height from 14 to 12 stories. We reduced 
the height of the base podium from 37 to 30 feet. We reduced the number of apartment units from 350 to 314. We revised the Wilson Avenue street facade articulation and enhancement of materials. We revised the Wilson Avenue street space activation by providing a bike room and glass enclosures on the, the reveal of the stairs. We made changes to the main entry and marine drive elevation. We added bird safety glass. And in fact, this issue was raised by the alderman very early in the process on behalf of Lana. We added low reflective glass. We increased the thickness of the glass on the north side for noise insulation. We added marine drive drop off and pickup and ride share management, which is part of our uh, submittal to CDOT. We've adopted an existing tree preservation program. We've enhanced the landscape plan on Wilson Avenue and Marine Drive, and we've committed to electrical charging stations in the garage. These stations are one of many tools that can be used to meet the sustainability code, but are not specifically required. We are choosing to commit to putting those in. The current proposed building in front of you is one that serves the market demand, is financeable, and it fits into the context of the fabric of the area. Additionally, I'd like to mention that we have completed the traffic study. It has been provided to CDOT for review, and I believe that the committee has received a copy of that. Um, I would also like to comment that this project will not be requesting any TIF or SSA funds. The project is estimated to create an additional six to eight million dollars in local spending and an additional $1.05 million in property taxes with an additional $715,000 in sales taxes. That does not include any incremental sales tax during the construction period. The project will create eight affordable housing units within this building, in addition to $3.1 million in cash for affordable housing, which would otherwise not exist but for this project. And I would like to echo one of the aldermen's comments that it is important to us that we earmark this for Sarah Circle because that is going to not just affordable housing, but also to house some of the homeless. Um, so at this time, what I'd like to do is hand it over to Joe Valario, our architect, who will just briefly go over the architecture. Joe, oh, thank you. Um, so Bob, uh, would you start the show? So this is just a quick review of what you've seen before. Um, and I uh, want to begin by looking at the first floor. Uh, the parking access is, uh, I'm sorry, beginning at the beginning. The uh, main entry of the building is at the corner of Wilson and Marine Drive. Um, it, uh, it now faces uh, Marine Drive directly. Uh, we've added, based on studies that we've done, a very large bike room, which is right adjacent to the entry, um, which can be accessed from the lobby or directly accessed from the exterior. Uh, we then have a very generous lobby that leads north to the elevator core uh, with a series of amenity spaces adjacent to the lobby facing out on Marine Drive. Uh, parking access for the uh, 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 building is from Clarendon, um, and it does not interfere with the CTA bus stop at that intersection. Um, and uh, uh, we're providing 135 parking spaces for the 312 apartments in the building. Oh, then along the north side of the building, right. we have the service and support spaces, yeah, including um, the um, uh, loading dock for the building, which is entirely in, uh, enclosed. Going up to the typical residential level, um, we have a mix of studio uh, one bedroom and two bedroom apartments. The two bedroom apartments occupy the corners of the building. Um, and then moving into the drawings, um, this is uh, uh, a section taken through Marine Drive on the top, uh, which shows uh, how our building relates to uh, Weiss Hospital to the north um, and the uh, Lakeview towers uh, to the south across Clarendon. Uh, as you can see, the building uh, is very much in scale with the other buildings in the neighborhood. Uh, the lower drawing is a section taken through uh, Wilson, looking north with our building, 
adjacent to the uh, Covington, um, which uh, required the amendment of the PD to include housing. So that is part of the uh, uh, record of uh, entitlements on this property. And then um, to the north, you see the North Eastwood Shores Apartments, again, which is actually slightly taller than our building. Going into the renderings, um, this is a view of the building from the corner of Marine Drive and Wilson. Um, and uh, again, there are brick accents used throughout um, with metal panel and glass infill inside those brick accents. Uh, the next drawing is a detail of that entry, uh, which as I said, faces out on Marine Drive. The next drawing is a detail the rendering of the walk along Wilson, um, which uh, working with DPD has been uh, significantly advanced. Then moving to the corner of Clarendon and, uh, and Wilson, you can see that corner of the building in both, uh, at the both ends of both of the elements which touch on Wilson, um, we have uh, exposed the stairs as a source of activity on the street. And then uh, next we have a view of the north elevation of the building as it faces the ambulance entrance and the, uh, and the uh, and Weiss Hospital with this entrance, which is off of Marine Drive. And finally, we have a, a two aerial views. This one taken from the southeast, uh, looking to the northwest, uh, with our building adjacent to the Covington and to uh, Lakeview Towers. And then the final rendering um, is an aerial view taken from the northeast, looking to the southwest, with uh, the service drive between the hospital and uh, uh, and our proposed building. Um, and that's a, a quick summary of the architecture of the building. So Paul? Yeah, so if I could just very briefly sum up, uh, again, my name is Paul Shadle, I'm with DLA Piper representing Lincoln Property. Um, I just wanted to reiterate something that the alderman said, and I'll just very quickly, quickly note a couple of zoning items procedurally. One, uh, we filed an application on May 26th, or we filed it a couple days before that. It was introduced to the city council on May 26th through the normal application process, actually along with seven or eight other applications that were filed that day. The project was referred to the zoning committee as a standard and it will be held and deferred until the project goes to the plan commission, if and when it goes to the plan commission. Um, and, um, I also wanted to add from a zoning standpoint, I understand the concerns Lana had cited as its highest priority concerns, traffic, building scale, and affordable housing. And I would just note from a traffic standpoint, um, as Joe noted, we have submitted the draft traffic study to CDOT. It's again, the standard process to do that. Uh, they, they would have to review and approve the conclusions of the traffic engineer for the project to proceed. Uh, but I believe the preliminary conclusions in that traffic study which are supported by traffic engineering standards are that the project would not have an adverse impact on the neighborhood. Uh, second, from a building scale standpoint, and we've discussed this in great detail with the Department of Planning and Development, from a use standpoint, from a bulk standpoint, that is from a floor area ratio standpoint, and from a density standpoint, that is number of dwelling units per unit of, of land, uh, this, this project is consistent with the fabric of the neighborhood. It's not the smallest project based on those units of measurement, but neither is it the largest. Um, so with that, we just wanted to say that our group is available for questions. Uh, thanks again for hearing us, and we would respectfully ask for your positive recommendation for this project. Thank you. Is, is that it for the presentation? That's it. Yes, sir. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Lincoln Property Company, for your presentation. We will now take questions from our committee members. A reminder that committee members should type in the chat to all panelists um, that they have a question. And Kylie will then call on each committee member when it's their turn. And, and out of respect for everyone's time, please keep your question concise to ensure that we fit in so many questions from as many people as possible. Thanks, Alderman Kappelman. 
First up, we have Chris White. Hi, you had mentioned, uh, you had said there were changes after the Lana meeting. Um, I wasn't aware of that. What changes were made in response to the Lana meeting concerns? Sure. Um, so basically following the, the series of Lana meetings, so we met with them, I think originally on January 28th, uh, and then again on June 3rd, which was our fourth meeting, uh, the low reflective glass was a result of the meeting starting from uh, January 28th. Uh, we increased the thickness of the glass. There was a request uh, from Lana with regard to the noise that could potentially be generated with the ambulance. Um, the Marine Drive drop off and pick up in the very first meeting that was discussed, we had not thought uh, that issue through. Uh, and then based on Lana's comment about that, we did come back and and committed to providing one. Since then, we have looked at this a little bit more diligently, and we have proposed to put that on Marine Drive. That is part of the current plans. Um, the existing tree preservation program, um, as a result of some discussions with Lana, we realized that we need to uh, make a very, very strong effort to save whatever trees are possible. We have since uh, put a landscape architecture, a long, landscape architect firm on the team. Um, and also with regard to that, the landscape plans. Uh, once we had spoken with Lana, we came back and reviewed and actually improved the landscape plans. And then the electrical charging stations, I believe those were brought up uh, maybe in the January 28th meeting. Um, and then uh, I think in subsequent meetings, we did notify Lana that that was something that we would commit to providing in the building. Michael? Michael Waltz? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I have one question. The biggest concern that the owners at 4300 Marine have is the traffic, and I think that's what we're hearing from everyone, but um, it may not be specific to this project, it might be something that needs to be done uh, as we go forward. There are, there's a lot of developments in the area that have been proposed or are underway. Uh, the traffic study referred to 1050 Wilson as having been taken into account. And then at one other place, it said other developments were considered. How much has this traffic study actually weighed the additional Wilson Avenue and the drive uh, proposals that we have in front of us? I, I I'll try. Can, can I try to answer that one? This is Paul. Um, the, the answer is we would. Ha that is precisely one of the elements that CDOT will have to review. Um, I'm not a traffic engineer. I, I honestly couldn't tell you what their exact data set is, but they did traffic counts. And if you if you dig deeper into the traffic study, you'll see that they studied the impact on levels of service at various intersections. Uh, but that that their methodology is exactly what is being vetted by CDOT. So I honestly can't give you a precise answer to that, except to say that CDOT has to review it and they won't let it proceed unless they're comfortable with the engineering that underlies it. Susie? Hi, thank you. I'll try and make um, two parts of this very fast. This is more probably with Alderman Kaplman and just out of not knowing all of the information is, how many rentals in a ward is ideal? So for the 46 ward, what sort of is that magic number? Uh, there's actually no magic number, but what we're finding in the last 10 years and the 10 years I've been alderman is that, uh, and I've been on the city's zoning committee for that time, um, almost all the developments are rental. Uh, that's just consistent across the country. Uh, and when that changes and there's more condominium development, that will occur. But uh, I think so far in the last 10 years, we've only had two projects that are condominium. So it's, 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 it's rare. And I, even including downtown, it's just very, very rare. So between the rentals or condos, whichever, whichever it is, whether it's rentals or condos, there's still um, numbers to our ward. Are there ever too many? Like, again, kind of that magic number, you can state there was a truly magic number for how many rentals would be ideal, but at some point, when does it become too much? And the reason why I state that is we have a lot of older condominiums in our ward that are trying to keep up with newer buildings because they get to have washers and dryers in their units or all these new bells and whistles. 
And I think a lot of condo owners in the area struggle to rent out their places. And when we're faced with all these newer rentals coming to market, it, it's very difficult for owners when they're insaturated by or saturated by these rentals. So at what point does it become too many rentals? I know you don't want to, I, I well, can't I mean, an answer on that, but an idea sort of for that. that. That would have been a good question 10 years ago, but our, our housing market has changed so dramatically, so quickly all over this country. Uh, it's, it's, it's what we exist right now. Our concern is uh, the lack of housing that exists in this city. And when there is a lack of housing and rental apartments, the law of supply and demand says uh, rents will go up and rents are going up right now in the uptown community. So the thought is, and it's based on research that's valid and reliable, that when you attack that law of supply and demand, when you add to the uh, supply, it will help stabilize rents. And that's that's the biggest concern right now. Sure, and while that may take time to get to that, great, you know, being able to balance things out. How do you deal with it in the meantime when everybody else is struggling um, until it gets balanced out when you have some newer rental units coming to the market and there's a lot of condominium buildings as well then? Uh, at, at this point in time, we can only develop what's being proposed and we're just we're just not having it i i know a lot of people have come to me and wished that there was more uh, condominium development but i also have more people wishing that there was more apartments rather than condos and they get upset by condos development so uh, you know it's 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 something that we struggle with but right now across this country we're going to be seeing apartments and we'll be seeing apartments for mm -hmm. a long long time sure thank you Robert? Uh, hi, this is a question for um, Joe Valerio, the architect. Hey, Joe, I've got a question. When I look at the renderings, which they look a lot better than the last meeting, um, I'm concerned about the what you think of as a green roof that looks just kind of like a golf course carpet on top of the building. Um, assuming that this is going to be a central air building, where is the chiller going to be? Because those things tend to be pretty monstrous looking and they tend to be stuck on top of the building without any concern of shielding or um, especially if you're walking by, they tend to kind of rain, there's like a rain effect on pedestrians. Uh, so I'd like to know how you came up with your, what is, what is, what is your green roof um, gonna contain? And also have you consulted an arborist for the trees and shrubbery that you're gonna put around your, uh, the new landscaping that you're proposing? Thank you. Oh, okay, hey, Bob, can you back up to the <laughs> rendering of the um, uh, the uh, north side of the building? Oh, stop, actually, go, go back one. I'm sorry. And it or might be kind of, I'm yeah. looking at this on so, a laptop, so. Okay, so uh, our penthouse, which is completely enclosed, is located on top of the building. Um, which you can see uh, just uh, to the west of the elevator core. So uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, we have two types of green roof. On the upper level, which is not really occupiable, we have what's called an extensive green roof, which is uh, really designed uh, more to mitigate the heat island effect that occurs in a big city. Our we have a small terrace at the top of the building on the 12th floor that faces the lake. That will have an intensive green roof, which means it's full depth of plantings. And then we Joe, also- could you show the view from the Southeast and show, show Robert where that is? There you go. So, right here. so we, we have a small uh, terrace that's right there with an intensive green roof, mean, meaning it's full depth plantings. It's, you know, small, uh, it's grasses, it's small shrubs, it's uh, small trees. And then on top of the, of the parking, we also have a major terrace area, uh, which is a combination of hardscape for uh, the use of the tenants and also an intensive green roof, which again is full depth planting. Uh, and then um, uh, 
uh, what was the last question? I'm sorry. I, I... It, it was actually two questions, and I apologize. But uh, getting to your green roof, have you consulted? Uh, are you just going to have a grass up there? Are you going to have any native native grasses or anything planted? Uh, my second question was, have you consulted an arborist about the kind of trees that you're going to plant? Because uh, you've got all this new landscaping design around the, the base of the building. So I'm just curious. Uh, you've got you've got a lot of trees there, but are you can you know? I assume you're going to consult an arborist or someone. Yes, our landscape architect has an arborist or a number of arborists on their staff. They're selecting plant materials now. We have to submit a detailed landscape plan before we go in front of plan commission that'll be reviewed by the city. And uh, uh, all that detail will be in there before it can go in front of the plan commission. And again, let me emphasize, we have intensive green roofs uh, in areas that uh, people occupy. The extensive green roof is basically, as I said, intended to reduce the heat island effect. It's living material, it's green material, but it's, it's, it's the, the intent is um, a part of our sustainable strategies, and not so much a part of our visual strategy. Got it, thank you so much. Okay. Mary Ann. Hi, I want to just speak on behalf of Lana and also just issue our final position numbers to the committee. So we had um, 107 votes come in from Lana. We had 86% of voters opposed to the development and 14% uh, in favor. Uh, and I do want to address some things that were said earlier. I know we talked, we received a traffic study last night. We received it at the same time as the rest of the committee. It is something we've asked for for a long time. Um, I understand that the alderman said at the beginning of this meeting that a traffic study couldn't be uh, done until an application had been submitted, but we did see a traffic study at the Immaculata Town Hall at the Buena Park Neighbors meeting, and I know that an application hasn't been submitted for that development yet. I want to let you know what Lana asked for. I know that we have a reputation for asking for large swaths of, of affordability, but what we asked for in terms of affordability compliance was that um, the developer comply with the ARO that will take effect in October of this year. So the new law, this would increase the number of affordable on-site units from eight to 16 out of 314. Um, we also asked for forward engineering for family size units. So we didn't ask them to change the size of any unit currently, but we asked that it be easily converted to family size units in the future. As a lot of uh, folks come into the neighborhood, I think we have a lot of transitional housing, um, the type of housing for people who are young and haven't started a family yet. And then these uh, neighbors fall in love with our neighborhood. Of course, we can empathize with that and they wish to stay. And then it becomes more and more difficult to stay here when a family size unit isn't available for purchase. Um, in terms of the densification of our neighborhood, within a 10 block radius of this development, we have uh, 2,200 new units that are either approved or currently under construction. So we are of course open to having additional neighbors and understand the economic benefits of that. Um, but this is definitely starting to be a concern in terms of uh, traffic and, and just density overall. Um, uh, in terms of the... Uh, um, the poll that Weiss Hospital took, I want to address that as well. That poll was sent to um, a listserv that of people who subscribe to their parking and their six-story structure. Um, and it didn't mention the development or show a depiction of the development at all. It just asked for a rezoning to support the hospital. It actually confused many of our members. Um, and we did have some people write to us and tell us that they had filled it out erroneously. Um, what we asked for in the last six weeks was really just a, a negotiation process with the developer. We had focused on the hospital's history at the April 29th meeting. This committee generously gave us six weeks to present what Lana thought was the most important and share that with Lincoln Properties, which we did. But the renderings that we're seeing now, I'm, I'm glad, Robert, that you think they look better, but I'm very confident that they're the same renderings that were shown at the April 29th meeting. Um, we did get some... Uh, I know the developer mentioned some improvements in landscaping and sustainability initiatives, which is very important to Lana. Um, but some of those were addressed uh, in earlier meetings prior to April 29th, so it wasn't part of the additional negotiation period that this committee allowed us. They started um, presenting these in January. The bird safe glass is, of course, very important, being close to the Montrose Sanctuary. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of Sarah Circle, we're, we're very supportive. We're supportive of the hospital. We're supportive of solutions for 
homelessness in our area, I just, um, we wonder if this is a false choice. Um, we want to be supportive of this without committing to uh, a, a development that's going to end up hurting some of our neighbors, so I know we'll talk later, that reside in the 811 West Eastwood building. And we're, to, to be clear, we're not opposed to development in general. Um, your vote here tonight doesn't mean that we're never going to develop this area ever. We're talking about this specific proposal. Lana is open to development on this plot of land. What we would like is a fair and equitable negotiation process with the developer, which we don't feel like we have. Um, this, because it is a plan development, it's subject to minor revisions. Um, at the um, plan commission, this can be based on value engineering. We're concerned about this. During this process, 811 Agatite and Clarendon Park had an additional story added to it. Um, and then we're also concerned about open space impact fees. We're grateful for the native landscaping and the additional research that the developer has put into uh, landscaping the green space, but um, the open space impact fees, we, uh, we know that we wanna recover those and keep them within the ward. Um, and I think that that is all for Lana. And I will just end with a question for Lincoln Properties. The alderman has talked about supply and demand of rentals. Are you prepared to lower your rental prices in a situation where the supply has gone up? Uh, we, we will follow the market. And if that case presents such a financial challenge, yes. We just came out of the pandemic. I can tell you right now that the revenue we had uh, anticipated to receive before the pandemic was much greater than the revenue that we received during the pandemic, and that was due to a smaller demand. I will add um, oh, one other thing about the uh, uh, the ARO, the Affordable Requirements Ordinance, because I know Lena asked me before about implementing the, the new version in October. Uh, the city, when they passed the revised ARO, they purposely waited for it to begin in October so as not to interfere with current uh, developments that are, that are in process. In addition, the city's law department and the commissioner for the Department of Housing have told all the aldermen that we should be abiding by the ARO and not be making up our own set of rules. And I will, I, I will, as the older person for the ward, I will take their legal advice. Glenn? Glenn, sorry, you're on mute. It's the bottom left-hand corner. <clears throat> can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. thanks. Yeah, I had a question for Irene, um, of uh, CEO of Weiss Hospital, and I just blanked my own screen. So if you can still hear me, I will keep talking. Yeah, we can still hear you. Yeah. Um, I'm not a terribly diplomatic person by nature, but I don't mean to make people uncomfortable. It seems to come naturally, so please forgive me. Um, the question is Irene's authority to make the statement about the disposition of the proceeds of the uh, sale of the parking lot. Um, you, you manage the hospital, but you don't own the hospital. And my issue, as I mentioned in the April 29th meeting, the building is fine. I, the building, great, terrific project. I'm so leery about pipeline and their previous history of less than straightforward dealing elsewhere in the, in the region concerning you know management of hospitals. It really has undermined my trust and confidence in the ownership of the project. Irene made a very clear statement about uh, assuring us that if we support this project, we're supporting Weiss Hospital, that 100% of the proceeds are to underwrite the operations and sustain financial sustainability of Weiss. Can you stand by that? If things go wonky a few years from now and mysteriously Weiss <laughs> is bankrupt and is there an accountability mechanism to, to hold to account that, that what you say will actually come to pass? Uh, just make me feel less uh, uncertain, please. Glenn, that statement was actually initially made by the owner of okay. Pipeline um, in writing 
So I, I have the authority based on the authority he has given me to make that statement to all of you. Okay. I'll add that if Weiss Hospital did fall into bankruptcy and it went to bankruptcy court and it was sold, um, the uh, buyer would be required to keep it as medical use. Okay. Thank you. Michael Warbeck. Um, just, a, just a quick comment. Our organization is concerned about a reduction in racial and economic diversity as a result of this project. So just want to put that out there, but also to clarify that the affordable housing that be, would be on site is for 60% of the median income, which essentially ranges from 40 to $60,000 for one to four person households. And typically developers will rent to people at the highest end of that income eligibility up to 60% as much as they can, especially if they're not familiar with affordable housing. So I'm curious if the developer owners uh, have experience with affordable housing. And I uh, am curious if the project were approved, would you be willing to affirmatively market your rental units to persons with rent subsidies who uh, typically have lower incomes and experience more discrimination in the community? I, I will add first, Michael, that um, the city's ARO is spelled out that it rents to people earning 60% of the AMI. And what we're seeing is a lot of people who want affordable housing, when they see developments like this, they want to apply and then they quickly get upset when they find out they don't earn enough income because their income is around 30% of the AMI. What is unique about this is that a large portion of the in lieu fee will go to Sarah Circle. And uh, uh, this uh, provides housing for people who earn between zero and around 15% of the AMI. So it, it provides badly needed affordable housing that we couldn't get if it was all on site for people earning 60% of the AMI. And, and developers, they, we cannot require them as a city to go below that. We can ask them, but we cannot require it. Could I add one thing about the ARO too? Um, I, I know there's been a comment that, well, they're just complying. It's true that they are complying with the ARO, but the ARO does allow 25% of the units, that is the units that must be built, to be built either on site or within two miles of the site. And it's fairly typical in my experience. I work with a lot of multifamily developers in and around Chicago. It's fairly typical for developers of market rate housing to build those units elsewhere because they're not experts in it. Uh, Lincoln has agreed to build those on site because the community has made clear, and we've been talking about this since early in 20, and it was made pretty clear by the aldermen and others that the, that the units should be on site. Well, we, are, we are supportive of the Sarah Circle project. I think so many people in the community are, but we also, and I don't think it should be put forward as that project's not gonna happen if this development doesn't happen because uh, there's gonna be huge funds coming down from COVID relief and other things. So projects that are ready to go, like Sarah Circle has a great development consultant working with them, they'll have funding available for their project. So thank you. I can add this, Michael, when uh, Sarah Circle applied for funds from the Illinois Housing Development Authority through the state, the state required them uh, in order to get IDA funds to receive $3 million from the city. There were three options. Uh, one through this in lieu payment, which the Department of Housing prefers, one through a, or through a TIF. Uh, we're looking at using TIF dollars to uh, assist with the Bazazin Library. Or the final option was through AHOF, the Affordable Housing Opportunity Funds. The issue is that if we use affordable housing opportunity funds to help with Sarah Circle, that's, uh, that means there's an elimination of another affordable housing project somewhere else in the city that provides housing for people earning between zero and 30% of the AMI. So that's one reason why Department of Housing thinks 
this is the preferred way of helping uh, Sarah circle out. Maria. Thank you. Uh, my question is about um, the renters of this, um, this building. Will the renters be allowed to offer their units as short-term rentals on platforms like Airbnb? And this question goes to my concern as well as many others about the stability of the community, the renters in that building as well as the community in general. Uh, no, they, they will not be able to rent short term, i.e. Airbnb. Uh, if there are sublet issues, we actually have to review and approve that. But there are no short term rentals allowed in our buildings. Jackson Morsey. Thank you, Kylie. Um, I don't have a question. I just have a brief statement from Clarendon Park Neighborhood Association. Um, we are the association covering the area just to the southwest of this proposal. Um, and we want to thank Lana for um, pushing for the, the time for us to be able to hold an open survey of Clarendon Park residents. Um, in that survey, 81.3% um, of residents said yes to the proposed change to allow for this development. Um, and 18.8% said no. Um, so as such, CPNA, um, if this comes for a vote tonight, we will be voting yes in support of the project um, to respect those residents who responded to our survey. Um, thank you. Scott, Scott Adams. So I have a uh, question for Irene. Um, this is a, and I, I spoke about this at the, at the last meeting. This is the parking lot is the sort of last major footprint for Weiss to expand operations in a, in a, in a undeveloped part of the hospital. Um, and it, it, you know, Weiss is a major, the, the major employer in, in our ward. I had a family member work in the ER last summer. So I, I value the role that, that Weiss has played. Um, but my question is, did, did Weiss or Pipeline look at options to expand the footprint and go bigger to serve the you know, needs in the community and in Chicago itself? Because uh, my, my fear here is that if we approve the zoning, I mean, basically what we're asking people to do is change the zoning go from something that could provide jobs on an ongoing basis that could provide more revenue for the hospital um, and say, no, we don't want any more expansion of jobs in a hospital. We just want to go to housing. And, and that's for me, a really significant thing. And I'm not, I'd like to hear what Weiss has, how they were, did they carefully consider selling the property or going bigger with a footprint in, in the medical field? <laughs> So um, uh, to add, to add, to add, to answer your question, and I okay, I'm off mute. Um, yes, we did. Um, of course, you know, as I continue to talk about growth of the hospital, want to make sure that we have adequate space for it. And the building adjacent to us, which is our medical office building, um, has adequate office uh, has adequate space for us to build out and expand our services. There's also space within the hospital building itself as not all of our floors are occupied. And, you know, just as an example, by closing one floor um, for remodel, once we are done with that floor, there will be another floor that will be unoccupied. So there is adequate space definitely in the hospital to continue to expand services. There is uh, movement to, towards outpatient services, which would, um, you know, our MOB has adequate space there. So um, we don't have any concerns that within the two buildings um, and the parking garage that we have adequate space for expansion and adequate space for parking. We are just about at time for committee questions. Does any other committee member have a question? Alderman Kappelman, that is all the questions for the committee members. 
Thank you, Kylie. So we'll now take questions from our attendees. Um, a reminder to please click the raise your hand button. If you have a question, Maggie will then call on you when it's your turn to speak. Um, when you're called on, you will be able to click unmute on your, on your screen. If you have any technology questions, you can write them in the Q&A box. And out of respect for everyone's time and to ensure that we get to as many questions as possible, please make sure that you stick to short and direct questions. Uh, Maggie will mute each speaker after their question in order to keep the meeting moving and to unmute uh, the next speaker. Thank you, Alderman Kappelman. Um, Kathy S., you should be allowed to speak if you would like to answer, ask your question right now. Oh, good evening. Um, I'm my question is, uh, how many vacant units are there in the developments that are really close to this? I drive by 811 at night and there's a lot of apartments that have no lights on. Or um, I know that there's advertising for Stuart Lofts, Lawrence House, and other places that have become expensive for small apartments. So what is the vacancy rate? rate uh, like, why is this building even needed? I, I think the idea of holding on to it for future use for medical stuff is a great one, but can you answer that? How many apartments are? Yes, I can. Uh, currently 811 is 96% occupied. Upshore is 93% occupied and Draper is 92% occupied. So the comparable set that we look at is on average 94% occupied. Now, is that owned or is that actually occupied? No, that is occupied by a tenant. Um, I, got, I got moved out of Uptown because of the rents going up and up and up. And this is just part of that gentrification move where everybody's taxes are gonna go up, the rents are gonna go up, um, and it is not, this is not available to people who have lived in Uptown for many years. I don't know what that sound was. Uh, for many years who want to stay in the community. This is getting built for other people to move in rather than for people who have been there for a long time who want to stay there. This is not a stable development for the community. Thank you, Kathy. Sure. To mute you and lower your hands. And Peter M, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself if you would like to ask your question now. Peter, are you able to unmute? I was unmuted. Okay. Okay. <laughs> there we go. We can do Okay, I'll try that again. For the alderman, does the CEO of Pipeline's statement in writing have the force, the full force of a binding contract? You know, that's a good question for the city's law department, uh, but I, I hear that concern about the loss of Weiss Hospital. Absolutely. I, I've been a social worker for 25 years at four different hospitals. And um, so I, I, I hear that and we don't wanna lose Weiss. Um, the, the fact of the matter is uh, if the unspeakable happened and pipeline for some reason broke their promise and decided to sell that property, 
um, they could only sell it to another medical provider, period. Uh, so uh, there will always be a hospital there. Uh, and and, um, and I think, I, I hope that it can address people's concerns. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'm going to mute you again. And then Mark K, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself. Mark, are you able to unmute? able to unmute. I am going to come back to you. I'm going to remute you. And we'll try again in just a second here. Marjorie B, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, given the fact that the Weiss Hospital is being protected, uh, I want to hear succinctly, what is the downside to this development? Because I've heard a lot of complaints, but I, I, I'd really like someone to succinctly say, what's the problem here? We need affordable units and we need rental units in Uptown. So can someone address why we should not do this? I, I believe um, Lakeside Area Neighbors Association uh, stated it very well, uh, the uh, case why they believe it should not happen. Uh, there are a number of different people that have a belief that building this will make uh, rents in uh, other area buildings unaffordable. Um, and, and we hear that time and time again, and, and that's an argument used all over this country. Um, there are research articles uh, that say the opposite. They say that uh, if you, because the uh, vacancy rate is so low in Uptown because people are moving into this area, it's by uh, building more and meeting that demand that it helps to stabilize the rents and if there are too many rental apartments, um, which the way if there's too many rental apartments, that would actually reduce the amount of rent because the the demand would go down. But you know, everyone has different feelings about it. Okay, thank you, Marjorie. I'm going to mute you once more, Mark. I have allowed you to unmute yourself if you want to try it one more time. Yeah, um, I just said, can you hear me? Hello? We can hear you. Okay. Hear you, Mark. Good. Um, I want to know from the alderman why there are so many buildings and organizations that have requested to be on the zoning and development committee and are not on it, including buildings that actually are on it where people who were, who were um, deemed to be the representative of that building asked to be part of this conversation and they're not being let on. Um, and I just want to say that it's very apparent from who is on the committee and who's not on the committee, that this committee, one, is not legitimate, is not representative of the community, is 920 Lakeside, they're not on, there's the Shryman House, they're not on, there's 4640, there's 850 Eastwood, there's a whole number of buildings, there's our organization, Northside Act for the Justice, that asked to be put on. So whatever this vote is, we consider it not legitimate, and we are going to continue. If if this if this vote actually is to pass the zoning change and to hand that land over 
the 314 units of luxury housing that we, won't, we don't need, just be clear that the people of the community are going to not allow this to happen and will continue to fight this. But I want to know why there are people who have should be at this meeting who were not allowed to be at this meeting. Thank you, Mark. Um, actually, a number of the buildings that you named are members of the 46 Ward Zoning Development Committee. Uh, when, when we look at the processes that uh, alder people use throughout the city. Uh, I am the only alder person in the entire city of Chicago that has a process that uh, involves representatives throughout the entire ward. The vast majority of alder people who do have zoning committees, it's made up of about five to 10 people. Um, we have close to 40 no ward comes even remotely close to having such a large group of representatives uh, for the Zoning Development Committee. The other thing that sets this apart is I have a process that uh, allows people to vote and uh, that vote is transparent. It's recorded so everyone knows how people vote. All right, Miracle J. I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself if you would like to ask your question. Oh, awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Alderman, I just wanna first say thank you so much for your leadership and your transparency here with this matter here and, uh, and other matters as well. Uh, Irene, this is for you. Uh, assuming you sell the supplement a lot, how will you use the resources to improve the hospital experience for patients and their families? Do you, do you have any specific plans that you're actually waiting on to act? And then this uh, real quick is for anyone from Lincoln. Uh, I find that, you know, we're, we're having a $3 million figure conversation that's to be earmarked for Sarah Circle. I think that's swell. Uh, at, the, at the end of the day, though, there's only six affordable units within the building itself. So I, I suppose I challenge you and I'd say, why not just go ahead and increase this number regardless of the current ARO and sort of a sort of, you know, be a leader here. Uh, uh, that would be the challenge, but uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. So um, I had mentioned a little bit earlier that we did start the construction on um, improving one of the floors of the hospital, renovating one of the floors of the hospital, um, completely gutting it. Um, we actually started program two weeks ago. So um, that including remodeling of our lobby and retrofitting elevators combined with the equipment that we purchased, the robotic equipment we purchased for, for this project, which is creating the state-of-the-art orthopedic unit. Um, it, it, it's a $5 million investment that Pipeline is making into the hospital. So we're not waiting, we're moving, we're going and we're growing. Um, and you're right, the funds are needed to continue to grow the space. Um, we, we have a geriatric behavioral health unit that has a long waiting list every single day. We could expand that unit by additional six beds, but it also requires funding. Um, I can continue going on and on. Our gender confirmation program just moved in into the medical office building next door. We continue to grow that service line as well. Hmm. Awesome. Uh, the yep. brand new EMR system that we just installed along with brand new financial system is a multi-million dollars investment. And our facility is, you know, it's a 60 year old building. So I have leaking boilers, I have chillers that need um, to be upgraded. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of investments that this building needs and that's exactly where that those funds are gonna go. Yeah, no, and it's really good to hear the plans. And specifically, I'm hearing all these things that you have in your mind. That means that Pipeline has them on their mind. And so, you know, the idea that it's not just gonna be this investment, there's a lot to do. So the hospital will continue to be here for the community uh, and, and ideally only get better. Uh, and then, and then uh, Lincoln, if you had the opportunity to answer my, my second question, it would be, uh, again, why not go ahead and increase the number regardless of the current ARO uh, and act out in good faith? Um, I think the community would, would think it'd be terrific of you. Really, I do. Sure. Uh, thank you, Miracle. Um, you know, really it's a balancing act between the economics and the affordable housing ordinance. Uh, obviously, it is something that um, we know we have to follow, um, but again, it's a balance uh, between the, the cost and the ARO. In this particular case, we find that the $3 million that will be, be contributed to the Sarah Circle project is actually going above and beyond what would typically be required of the ARO because it is below the 60% AMI. 
So uh, we feel that that's actually a bonus for the affordable and for the homeless uh, communities. And in addition, Commissioner Marisa Navarez um, stated that if we re uh, ask developers to go beyond the affordable requirements ordinance, we can only do it as an incentive. And so we have to give them an incentive to go beyond uh, that state law. Uh, uh, because that can get so uh, confusing to so many people, and we don't yep. want 50 yep. different sets of rules from different 50 different older people, uh, the, they're asked to really stick to the ARO. Yep, yep, no, uh, I certainly hear you. Alderman, thank you again for your leadership. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Jacqueline P. You should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, um, I just like to say that we need affordable housing in Uptown and this luxury housing will only further increase rents and push the people of Uptown out. Um, and that this contribution to Sarah's circle is nice as um, a lot of people have been stating, but as a lot of people have also um, hinted at, at the end of the day, luxury housing construction accelerates gentrification, which will only further increase the housing crisis. Um, and so I'd like uh, the alderman to speak to that and um, uh, the impact of, of gentrification and um, yeah, thank you. Sure, um, the, uh, there's an article um, uh, entitled Supply Skepticism, Housing Supply and Affordability. And it speaks to that concern that, uh, that you have that luxury housing is going to uh, make the area, the area, the rents go up. And what a valid and reliable research is finding is that that is not the case. Um, um, what are your and, sources? Uh, the source is from the housing policy debate article. Uh, and this is just a single source that you're- No, I can um, give you another source as well. Uh, the up there's also a whole lot of sources out there that say that when in in people's experience too that luxury luxury housing increases gentrification and so it's um a little upsetting to hear you cherry pick research in order to support well, um profit I, th this is based um on research that's both valid and reliable. I would encourage you to Google the Upjohn Institute. They have an article entitled, The Effect of New Market Rate Housing Construction on the Low Income Housing Market. Uh, it, it would be uh, enlightening for a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you. Izzy D, you should be able to unmute at this time. Hi, can you hear me? We can, yes. Hi, um, my name is Mike Simmons. I'm actually the state senator for the seventh district. That Izzy Dobo, that's uh, someone on my staff. I apologize for that. Um, I just wanted to, to observe a couple of things. I live in Clarendon Park, so I'm literally right in the backyard of this site. And you know, the, the thing that really scares me is that I'm just worried that Uptown is losing a lot of its diversity. Um, I certainly love this community because of that diversity. And I had a personal experience of um, a few years ago, I was actually priced out of my apartment in 2018. I lived at Hazel and Montrose and it looked to me like a number of the more expensive units that have come to the immediate vicinity there uh, were concurrent with my rent going up $250 and it, it ended up pushing me out of the Eastern part of the neighborhood. And so I'm just worried about that happening to other people. Um, I really want this to remain a diverse and vibrant community that all people can access. Um, I grew up in this district. Um, you know, I'm an African American person, half Ethiopian. There are a lot of people of color and white folks that don't have a lot of money that call this home. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I think it's the envy of the country, and I really don't want us to lose that. And so, I just wanted to to observe on that because I live in the area. I would just hope that people would keep in mind the kind of bigger picture of the uh, excessive upward uh, pressures on rents that we're seeing in the area, and that there's some kind of plan that if this development goes forward, that um, you know, as many people as possible can be able to call this home. Thank you. Kathy P, you should be able to unmute at this time.
Kathy, are you able to unmute? Okay, Kathy, I'm gonna come back to you. In the meantime, Lucas A, you should be able to unmute. Okay, hi. Um, I had a question for Lincoln regarding one of their written responses to Lana about um, the possibility of adding family-sized units. Um, you had mentioned that 55% of units of that size are currently vacant. Um, I wanted to know, is that is that a ward level measure? Is that in the neighborhood? Is that the city? Is that national? Is that just other Lincoln properties? Um, where's that number from? And um, how long in the future would you project that out given that um, that's been one of Lana's requests and that's one that um, uh, isn't in this proposal currently? Sure. Uh, the 55 percent that we've referred to uh, of the three bedrooms that are vacant that is within a pool of properties that we manage within the city of chicago and they are like properties because what i mean by that is when we look at a comparison set we look at similar properties so in those properties which is what we're building here which we're proposing to build um, we will look at similar properties and in all those properties the three bedrooms are 55 percent vacant at this time Tyler H, you should be able to unmute at this time. Hi there, yeah, this is Tyler. Um, I live at 811 West Eastwood. Um, I'm an owner, I recently purchased within the last year. Uh, my partner and I were extremely excited um, to move to Uptown, i um, extremely excited that we had um, a rooftop patio, um, extremely excited that we have this gorgeous view um, of Clarendon Park, of the lakefront park, of the lake itself. Um, this building is going to significantly reduce our view. Uh, we have several several owners um, in our building concerned about um, not being able to market our building, uh, which is a condo building. Um, we're not gonna be able to market our building as having lakefront views anymore. Um, we're also uh, very concerned about affordability, um, the lack of two bedroom units in it. I just. I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding how this actually benefits uh, actual owners in the neighborhood. Thank you, Tyler. Kathy P, I'm gonna try one more time. I've allowed you to unmute. Kathy, are you able to unmute? Okay, Kathy, if you'd like, I can read off of your question in the Q&A section. If you wanna put it back in the Q&A section, I can read it out for you. In the meantime, while you do that, I'm gonna move on. To All right, Colleen H you should be allowed to unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Um, I had a question. So with ARO, often units set aside as affordable are the smaller units in the building. And I know we just talked about how there's not going to be a lot of um, larger two bedroom units, but out of those, will any of those be set aside as affordable? Because family housing, especially affordable family housing is much more scarce. And um, I was just wondering if, those units are going to all be um, on site if they're all gonna be the like studios and one bedrooms or if some of those will be saved for affordable. Uh, Joe, I can answer if you'd like. This is Paul sure. again. The, 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 Colleen, the, um, the city's ARO requires 
that the distribution of affordable units roughly track the distribution of the market rate units in terms of type. So you can't, you can't for example, say, oh, all eight units are going to be studios. Um, and so okay. uh, the Department of Housing will require that there be a distribution. And as if the, if the PD is approved as part of that, there will be an actual affordable housing profile that will be incorporated into the ordinance that describes that unit distribution. That's a requirement of the ARO. Oh. Okay, I appreciate it. I just was curious, um, you know, if more of those would be set aside than that's just required um, based on the need that's out there, but I uh, appreciate your answer. Thank you. Okay, and then just to let everyone know to set expectations and just to be aware of everyone's time this evening, um, the next, we only have time for three more questions. So I'm just gonna go in order from when people raise their hand. So Greg W, if you would like to unmute at this time. Hi there, yeah. Um, can you hear me, may I proceed? Yes, we can hear you. Cool. Um, first of all, yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Um, my, uh, my question uh, is, is something that um, I think is of interest to, to get out. Um, it's, it's for, um, for CEO of Weiss, um, you know, just about, uh, why we're being told that the kind of one-time revenue from selling a parking lot is necessary to assure the future of the hospital. I mean, there's, there's just like, could you speak to where that fits in kind of a, you know, like revenue and economic picture? Um, there's also the fact that uh, last time the ownership of the hospital was disclosed, about 70% of it belonged to two private equity firms, Deerfield and Davidson Kempner, um, one of which is the uh, 12th largest globally. They have 10 billion and $32 billion of assets under management. So, you know, the, the parts of the question are if, you're owned by entities that have at least, you know, like $42 billion um, in their total business enterprises. Why is selling a parking lot so important to your future stability? And the other thing that I think is important to speak to there is uh, the arrangements by which money flows the, the other way, but by which, uh, you know, anything that you could say about how uh, you know, kind of fee structure and what you need to pay to these private equity firms. I'll start with the last question first. It's easy for me to answer. Um, there's no money going back to Pipeline or Deerfield DK or any of our other investors. On the contrary, there's a significant amount of funding that comes from them into the hospital. And the $40 million investment that I spoke about before came from our investors and Pipeline. And um, you know they basically subsidized the operation of WISE and they have since the acquisition. Um, I, I can go on and on about the condition of the hospital and um, equipment and, and facilities upon the acquisition, but um, you know this hospital is significantly underfunded and undercapitalized. And while we are working with all the different sources, our state government included, um, we need to um, continue to grow and growth requires investment and funding. And the, the proceeds from the sale of the lot will allow us to do exactly that. It'll bridge the gap for us now while we need um, capital funding, we need capital funding for programs, we need capital funding for facilities to continue to serve this community till we're solidly on our feet um, and, and are able to sustain um, on our own. Okay, Melissa T, you should be able to unmute yourself at this time. Melissa T. I'm going to go to Ruth C. You should be able to unmute at this time. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? We can, yes. Hi. 
Um, so I wanted to tag off of Tyler's question that went unanswered. Um, he said, how does this project benefit the owners in the area? I am an owner on Lakeside Place. I've been around the corner from Weiss for, um, gracious, 10 years as of last month. And I love this neighborhood. And as a homeowner of a condo, um, I do not see a benefit to my neighborhood with this building, um, especially thinking about if I were single and working as a nurse in the area, I would only be able to afford a studio apartment in this building with like, you know, student loan debt um, and various, you know, the cost of living. Um, so I don't understand how something of this price point is going to be good for our community when me myself as a professional nurse would struggle to get a one bedroom in this building. Um, so I, if you could speak to that as, so back to Tyler's question that went unanswered, how would this building being built here in our neighborhood benefit those of us who currently live here and own condos and pay taxes. If someone could please speak to that. I'll, I'll jump in. It, my thought is this development would help Sarah's circle. It wouldn't, you know, it, there are benefits to, to everyone, but it really benefits uh, people who are experiencing homelessness, especially women. Uh, who are living on the streets, uh, many of them with all types of past trauma and many of them with mental illness. So uh, that $3.1 million is desperately needed uh, to, to help the most vulnerable. And there's many of them living in the uptown community. Okay, and then this is gonna be our final question for this evening. Again, just to be aware of everyone's time. Um, Milani E, you should be able to unmute yourself. I'd like to turn my question over to Melissa, who I believe was waiting. I actually have two questions and um, I can, geez, if you're not able to get her on, but she was waiting first. Melissa T, you should be able to speak at this time. Yes, can you hear me? Can. Yes. Oh, okay, it's my headset isn't working. No, no worries. So sorry, was that a question for me or? So I know you had your hand raised earlier. Did you have a question that you'd like to pose to the developing team and Yes, kind of. Um, so I'm Melissa from 811 West Eastwood. And with Tyler, I'm one of the newest owners here, an investor in this building and really excited to move to this diverse community. And that's been really important to us. Um, our building of 47 homeowners and about 80 residents, we do not have any formal representation on this committee, yet arguably we're probably the most impacted condo building um, with this particular development. And we've tried to keep an open mind and been really um, forward with our thoughts and feedback. And we're not opposed to a development in this um, parking lot. However, um, I think that it's been a very rushed process from our perspective. Marianne's done a great job representing our points of view and things like that. But Honestly, this has um, been a big disappointment. We invested with this lake view and I moved here to live in Uptown and this feels like the suburbs. And um, it's very disappointing to me that, um, you know, someday starting a family and that building, I won't have any family neighbors and it doesn't seem to support a diverse type of community. So. We're disappointed and we have asked Lincoln Property on various occasions if there's anything that they would do to help support our historic building. Um, I don't think we ever got a real response from that, um, but that's 
kind of where we're coming from. So we hope you guys understand and get some more um, feedback. But if you have any questions for us, please let us know. Thank you, Melissa. And then Alderman Kappelman, that was the last question um, that we have this evening. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for asking your questions and providing feedback on this project. Out of respect for everyone's time, we will now move on to uh, committee deliberation. Uh, the committee will determine whether or not they want to vote tonight. So at this point in time, uh, we're asking uh, the representatives from the developer and, and Weiss Hospital to uh, lead this meeting so that uh, the uh, committee members can deliberate. Thanks, and thanks for having us. Yeah, thank thank you, you, everyone. And we would just respectfully ask if we would greatly appreciate a decision tonight, if that's possible. Uh, we've, we've actually feel like we've gone through a pretty robust process since early in 2020, and we've tried to respond to multiple constituencies and, um, again, are just very anxious to get going on, on construction. So thanks very much for having us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So I believe our process is if committee members have a question, you raise your hand and uh, Kylie will call on you. There are there any questions? Um, Lake has his hand raised. Thank you, Kylie. Um, so I'm here representing the North Halsted Business Alliance. It was our intent at the April 29th meeting to abstain from this vote uh, due to this project being so far removed from our corridor. Um, having personally been involved in some of the Lana meetings and uh, hearing the interactions between Lana and uh, Lincoln uh, developers, at the last meeting, we were grateful that the vote was delayed so we could do more research on this project. We were quite disappointed uh, that the developer moved forward with an application with the city, city's zoning board prior to this body voting, as it was apparent that this body uh, did want to make an informed decision and make the vote at tonight's meeting. Uh, Alderman Kaplan, we appreciate your um, adding color to that context uh, at the beginning of the, of the meeting to explain why that was done. Nevertheless, we were disappointed that, that it did happen. Um, we do wish to support Weiss. Uh, we think it's a value part of our, of our neighbor to the north. Um, however, we will not do so at the detriment to the neighborhood. We do believe that zoning, uh, that, that area was zoned for a certain reason for the certain uses and rezoning it uh, for strict single use uh, condos uh, would, would not be in the best use of the neighborhood. Um, and I want to ask my fellow committee members and organizations that if you if your organization was in a similar situation where you felt sidelined by the developer, as Lana has, uh, that you would want this body to protect your interests. Um, so rather than uh, abstaining from this vote, we will be voting in solidarity with Lana, however they choose to vote this evening. If I would like... I would like to hear from Martin Sorge, who's actually um, head of the local Chamber of Commerce instead of the Chamber of Commerce far south. So um, Martin, are you available? Sure, I am. Hi everyone. Um, and just so you guys know, I'm Martin Sorge with Uptown United. Um, our development partners committee met with this developer twice to review the project. Um, and the committee decided to support the zoning change they request. Um, and for folks who don't know, our committee is comprised of about a dozen of professionals in the field of real estate, architecture, landscape architecture, affordable housing, urban planning, small business development, retail, um, and some other expertise areas. Um, and most of them, all of the members either live, work, and or own property in Uptown. A um, couple of reasons why we support the project are that the purchase of the property will benefit the hospital and help the hospital to continue to invest in the facility and the personnel and expanding their programs. 
Um, I've spent a lot of time in the hospital and can, you know, clearly echo what Irene said that the hospital does not need this extra space for medical use. They have a significant amount of room to expand in the medical office building and in the hospital itself. Um, and the project will welcome new neighbors to the community and these neighbors will support our local businesses. Um, our committee didn't think that this project would have a significant negative impact on traffic or parking in this location, which is very well served by both transit and bike infrastructure. Um, and we really applaud the developer for their innovative plan for complying with the affordable requirements ordinance to direct their in lieu fees to Sarah's Circle, um, which was a project that we strongly supported their most recent project on Sheridan and Leland. Um, and I really want to encourage other members of this committee to join us as the local um, economic development organization to support this zoning change request. And one other note that is, is really important to us is that, you know, as the local economic development organization, um, we've been really saddened to see that a lot of folks involved in this zoning process have started to cast Wise Hospital in a really a less than favorable light, making some unfounded claims about the hospital. And the, and the future of some of its important services, making it seem like they were in jeopardy. Um, you know, Weiss has served Uptown for 68 years, and the current ownership has made tremendous investments in the hospital since they took over ownership, far more than the previous owner, who didn't do nearly as much as Pipeline has done for the hospital, in my experience working with the hospital. Um, and they've added new services, they've expanded, as Irene talked about, and they really did an amazing job of serving the community during the pandemic. Um, and the other thing that is important to add is that, you know, the idea that we promote a lot at Uptown United it, with shop local, support your local businesses, that extends to our local healthcare providers. They need customers and clients so that they can grow and succeed as well. So kind of lastly, just want to say, you know, as much as you can talk to folks about the quality care that's available at Wise Hospital and support them just like you do local restaurants and retailers. Thank you, Martin. Len? This is one of the hardest decisions I've faced on this committee. Um, I'm weighing the pros and the cons on the basis of my own values and those of my constituents. And, uh, you know, the, the pros, why I should support the project is ostensibly it uh, supports Wise Hospital. Um, uh, the money goes to Sarah Circle, blah, blah, blah. Nice, fancy new building. And the cons, as I see it, is uh, contributing to the acceleration of gentrification in the neighborhood, which I don't think is a good thing. Gentrification, I think, is not a great thing for, for uptown. Um, and, and the other con is I'm, I'm stuck on, uh, I'm just suspicious of pipeline. And I haven't heard, to my satisfaction, an accountability uh, mechanism for knowing that proceeds will be used as directed and, and so forth. So I'm, I'm at this moment, I'm inclined to uh, not support the project for those reasons. Marianne. Um, I want to address uh, first um, uh, Martin's comment and, and then Glenn's comment about pipeline. And then I also want to talk about the process for Lana and how that went. Um, we do have another meeting of this committee next week to discuss another development. Um, so to start with um, the what Martin was talking about, supporting local businesses and supporting Weiss Hospital, Weiss Hospital serves a primarily Medicaid population. So the type of uh, renter that this building is attracting is not the traditional customer of Weiss. We would agree that we want additional customers to go to Weiss and to go to other businesses in our area, but we have to recognize um, the uh, obstacles that businesses in our neighborhood face when we are a very integrated neighborhood, especially Lana. Lana is 36% white and um, the remainder are people of color. And it's the second highest poverty census tract on the north side. Um, so this, when you're talking about supporting local businesses, think about the demographic that needs to be added to to support that particular business. I also want to talk about Pipeline and why Lana has been skeptical of Pipeline. Pipeline has never said that they are going to close Weiss Hospital. I want to make put, just put that out there and make it clear. The reason that we're skeptical is because they lied to state legislators about closing one of another hospitals that they purchased, Westlake, which is in Melrose Park. So the fact that they said that they were gonna keep it open, they ended up paying a $1.5 million lawsuit to the village of Melrose Park for lying. 
And uh, it came out that it was in the bankruptcy transcript um, of Westlake that they had actually promised tenant that they were going to close it when they bought it. So they they knew they were going to close it and they lied anyway, which is why we just are skeptical of whatever they tell us. Their actions, um, what they've said up to this point, it sounds great to us. We really would like to believe them, but because they've set this level of distrust up, that is, is the source of our distrust. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is how this process has gone down with Lana. So um, the developer did a, quite a bit of negotiation with Department of Planning and Development. That's a city department. It's not a community process. That started in the beginning of 2020. This project was first publicly made available to us in late November of 2020. We had our first meeting with the developer in January of 2021. So our negotiations have gone on for about five months. Um, again, like I said at the beginning of the meeting, there's been very minimal changes based on Lana's feedback. If any, we were able to go back and locate some of the changes in previous meetings. Um, and we want this negotiation process that other block clubs get. I've been a part of this committee for a few years now, and I watched in Sheridan Park as you negotiated through uh, many different proposals. And we're watching the development that we're going to vote on next week at 3636 Lakeshore Drive. That's had multiple changes from the developer and a very long multi-year negotiation with the New York Private Residences 3600. Um, East Lakeview Neighbors has had several meetings. I started to go to meetings about that development in 2018. So it really gives me pause that Lana has had such a different and rushed and abbreviated experience than East Lakeview Neighbors. Um, and I think that all of us representing a block club, representing a building, want, want this process to be fair and equitable. I would like to address some of those uh, some of those items. I mean, I think the pipeline concern, it's very true. And you're not the only one that's concerned about pipeline. Um, I think that we really thoroughly discussed that last time. And I think the committee wanted to move on to the building. And so I think if we could stick to um questions and comments about this specific development because we did and we spent so much time last time on pipeline um and kind of what we came up with um so that's number one number two this is not even comparable this pro this uh project is not even comparable to the um one proposed at 36 36 north lakeshore drive the reason that they've gone through years of negotiations is because they share legal space and so there had to be legal negotiations between many attorneys to review that. That is not the case here. Um, most of our, I mean, there were, you there were three neighborhood organization meetings for this project. That usually does, that's more than usually happens just because the neighborhood organization starts out discussing the building, which is not what Lana did. And so the reason that there is an additional meeting is because, uh, was because, um, your group did not start out discussing the meeting, you were discussing pipeline for two meetings. And so now you, in this last one, you asked for some changes and, um, and yes, there weren't as many made, but like I said, the reason was because, you know, there was a difference in how you, how you approached this, pro this process that compared to other um, neighborhood organizations. And who's next? Chris, did you still have a question? Um, I, I had a, another question about the hospital, about the assertion about the right to close, which I disagree with, but I, since we're not talking about that, I'll withdraw it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Martin? We can't hear you yet, Martin. Um, if you click Marty? the, Marty, if you click the microphone icon on the bottom left, there we go. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. As you all may know, my portfolio here is historic preservation. And of course, um, this is a vacant lot right now. It's a parking lot. So uh, you might think there's no preservation issue here, but this is the lakefront and this is the lakefront parks. And uh, so then my interest becomes whether this is going to be an attractive addition to this location. This is a very important location. It's the gateway to central uptown. Uh, and I think we have to keep in mind that, and Marianne made that point just a little while ago, uh, if this gets turned down, there will be other proposals. And maybe the proposals that come next time, for instance, won't put a big black building in the middle of the park. I don't understand whose idea that was, but I, people are gonna turn off the Lakeshore Drive and say, who built that black thing? 
And uh, that, that could be changed with the current developer, uh, but it also could be changed with the next time around. And it's important to remember, we have this experience in Sheridan Park not all developers give up and walk away when they're turned down. They Sometimes they come back with a better proposal. And uh, I, I would certainly hope that that's going to be the case here. Uh, so I'm gonna be voting against this. Okay, I'd like to call on Jackie Taylor. Her hand button isn't working. Jackie, can you unmute? Yeah, I'm trying my damnedest. I don't know what's wrong with <laughs> Sorry about that. With my computer tonight. Um, uh, I want to just comment and thank the alderman because this, this, this is historical that we have 46 members from the committee, from the community who have a vote and a say. And that has not happened anywhere. Uh, so I, I just, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that. Um, this is our community and, I'm, I, and we're all on this call again for uh, now almost two hours. So I hope that we will vote very soon. Um, I'm in agreement with Glenn in terms of this is a very, very difficult decision. Uh, I respect everyone's views and understand where everyone is coming from. For me personally, I'm looking at what are the benefits for the community? for the whole community uh, and looking at the benefits for the whole, it does benefit some, it does not benefit the whole and just hearing the different pros and cons, um, this decision weighs very heavy on my heart and it's a very difficult decision, but I received a lot of emails, people who <laughs> I've never heard of before, who uh, know that I'm on this committee and poured their hearts out in terms of how they feel and what they feel and so forth and so on. So I, I have to weigh those things also uh, in terms of, of evaluating. And um, I'm going to vote for the, 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 the benefit of what I feel will impact the most in the community. And that's going to be no. Okay. Uh, I think I have a pretty good understanding of a few of the groups in opposition. I did want a little clarification from Marty, whose perspective is a little different than somebody living right next to it. Is the design of the building, Marty, your primary uh, opposition to it, or do you have uh, substantial concerns with how that interacts with uh, less the traffic patterns, but for instance, population density, location, uh, any of those other things, or is it primarily aesthetic related to the design? Okay, thank you for asking, um, because I, there was one other point that I forgot to make. Um, the scale of the building is not objectionable. You have to expect something like a 12-story building in a spot like this. Uh, it would be bigger if it weren't for the original plan development. But the other point I'm interested, you know, you can fairly ask me, how would you the next project be better than this. And one way the next project could be better than this is it could have services in the building, 300 units that are going to be there. Uh, this building has no services except parking. It has, I suppose, mail delivery. It doesn't have uh, a dry cleaning drop off. It doesn't have a coffee shop or a restaurant. And so the 300 people here 
uh, maybe you saw the developer's answer to this. The developer's answer was, well, we don't want to take business away from Broadway. I think that's disingenuous. I don't think that's the real reason. I think the real reason is it'll be easier for them to rent those units as uh, rental apartments. And the result is we're going to have 100 cars driving from this building over to Broadway to drop off their dry cleaning and to get their cough. And so that's, I think that's a defect in this proposal that could obviously be improved the next time around. So it's not only aesthetic, it's also uh, functional. And the, at the end of the day, I, in order to vote against the local block club, I have to see a strong reason to do that, and I don't. Thank you. Anna? Hi, thanks. Um, so I'm very glad to have heard that Glenn found this a very challenging decision since this is my first, this, this is my second meeting being on the committee and my first one was the last one. So it was really to, to hear that this, this is really, really hard, this one. I, I can definitely see both sides. Um, and I, I have concerns about, I'm not in general opposed to development, but I, I am skeptical. I'm one of these housing skeptics. Um, I, I sort of tried very quickly to, to scan some of the research that the alderman was referring to during the meeting. It's kind of hard to, to get the gist, but I'm not convinced by the arguments. And I find it difficult that we seem to be relying on statistics that come from the developer. Like they're talking about, well, this is the occupancy rate in the buildings that we manage. Okay, but those are very specific types of buildings. It would be great if we could actually have more objective research to look at so we can make up our own minds. But I can tell you as a representative of 3950, which is um, not in Uptown, but it's right on the border on Irving Park. We have a lot of rental units in our building and they are very affordable for the market rate. And we have a lot of them stand empty for a while. So I'm not super convinced by this argument that we need this particular type of building that we would be competing with. And we're one of the more affordable buildings on the lake, definitely. <laughs> so um, I, I can see the need for more development, but this does not convince me as the kind of development that we need. And I also am disturbed by the fact that the people who live around this development are not convinced that it's going to benefit them. So. I'm inclined to listen more to them than to some of these development arguments, which I think are kind of standard generic arguments for development as such. Um, and as for the hospital, I know we're not supposed to think about that, but the, the practice of parceling off real estate holdings of hospitals that have been purchased by private equity firms is very common. And um, I, I don't feel great about encouraging that. <laughs> so um, thank you all for contributing to a very informative discussion. I do want to say that those properties that they brought up about their, um, their vacancy rates, those are not properties they manage. Those are properties in the neighborhood. And um, I have been told by those owners that those are actually the vacancy rates. They're very, very low. They are pretty much around 90% occupied. But those are just buildings right around them. I mean, it's a large neighborhood, right? Like we're, we right, but they are, but they're, but that's the neighborhood we're talking about. So that's what I'm saying. But you know, I I was looking for, I have two children and I was looking for a three bedroom apartment in this community and it's exceptionally difficult. I mean, I find that mm -hmm. very compelling. Yeah argument that the buildings are going up that are not having more than two bedroom apartments and you know they say oh there's no demand for it but one reason for that is because three bedroom apartments are absolutely unaffordable so yeah so that's a separate that's a separate thing than okay, what you were talking that's, about that's that's a reason to not you know for, for me sure. i want to support a development that isn't going to increase that stock in the neighborhood because that just contributes to the flight of families from the neighborhood got it Jackson. Thank you, Kylie. Um, so I represent Clarendon Park Neighborhood Association, and we've held surveys on many different 
um, developments in our, our area in the, in the past couple of years. Um, and almost every survey, 80% of people have been supportive of development in the Clarendon Park area. This development is just across the street um, from the park on the north side of, of our um, neighborhood association area. Um, and I think reading a lot of the comments that people have left on the surveys for this development and um, previous developments in our area, um, there is a rental shortage in our neighborhood. A lot of people have discussed um, how difficult it has become to find apartments in our neighborhood. Um, and they want to see um, vacant lots and parking lots filled in with the highest and best use um, to provide more housing for residents in Clarendon Park. Um, and they also want to um, see many of our vacant storefronts um, filled. Uh, if you go along um, Wilson, um, Sheridan, and, and Montrose, um, kind of around our neighborhood, um, we have a very high vacancy of storefronts. And so we want to see more residents, uh, more potential customers in our neighborhood um, to support these businesses and, and, and um, also potential residents to open up businesses within the neighborhood. Um, while we recognize that um, new development tends to be more expensive, um, those people that move into that neighborhood also have a higher disposable income to support businesses within the neighborhood. Um, and it also keeps them from competing with um, some of the lower priced rentals within the neighborhood um, and, and keeps those that housing stock available for um, existing residents and keeps them from being pushed out. Um, we need to increase the supply of housing um, to keep our piece of Uptown as one of the most affordable pieces of Uptown. So Mike. just so you know, we have, we're getting, uh, it's about two minutes to nine. So um, just want to keep people mindful of the time. Thanks, Tressa. Michael? Uh, yeah, just a couple quick comments. One is that uh, one of the reasons why the uh, Edgewater Hospital, when it closed, stayed a vacant hulk for so long, it not only had debt, but the aldermen basically engineered uh, selling off the, the parking lot land all around there and limited the different flexibilities for growth and use and mixed uses that could benefit the community. Um, so that was an old story. I'm not saying it perfectly relates here, but the idea of getting cash from this development to infuse into the Weiss Hospital short term, that's a great thing. But long term, if we think long term, like the founding fathers or whatever in, in, our, in our parks who, who were very careful about putting residential buildings uh, and, and anything besides museums and hospitals in the park areas, you know, I kind of, I'm really kind of amazed that people are okay with just putting new density and new traffic right in that, in that, that location. It makes uh, no sense to me, but uh, Weiss Hospital is such an important institution. We got to support it, but let's be real. Thinking long-term, if that building is sitting there, that hospital complex cannot grow and become a first-rate institution. Uh, that's just my opinion. But I think we got, and, and on the affordable housing front, the Sarah Circle deal will get done. You know, I know that you know, with due respect to the alderman, there's gonna be money that'll, that'll come in for that project. And uh, the affordable housing that's supposed to be on site is not gonna be, it's not really affordable. It needs, the rents have, have to be half as much. Thank you. Scott? I want to thank you guys for running a, a on-time meeting. So I'll try to be really quick here. I mean, I, I sort of alluded to it earlier. It's, it's you know, we're, we're being asked to change the zoning away from really one of the last, probably the last medical footprints to expand to put up more housing. And, you know, we need jobs, we need housing. Uh, you know, they, they, you know, made their proposal and I, I came in sort of, undecided, slightly leaning against, and I did not hear anything that changed my mind and some of the things that people have said about, 
you know, losing the footprint and the chance to expand for, for pipeline to come in and sell off a, a valuable asset, you know, we have a say in how land should be developed. And it is a place that could create good paying jobs for the neighborhood. And, you know, housing will come in other places, but this is a, a different lot. And every development that we look at is, is different. Um, and this one is about what do we do with this? Do we want to try to keep encouraging more jobs and medical facility expansion, or do we want to go housing? And I'm, I'm not convinced that this is the, the right development for that place. Jackson? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to Michael about the, the density and why we should have density in this area. This is one of the most transit served neighborhoods anywhere in Chicago. Um, we have the brand new Wilson Station just on the west side of the Clarendon Park neighborhood. Um, we have multiple express buses um, on either side of this proposed site. Um, and uh, I think Clarendon Park residents really want to see um, that we make use of the, the transit served location that our neighborhood is um, and, and making it available to the most residents possible. Um, and equitable TOD has been one of the big issues in Chicago um, and making sure that um, transit served um, locations are, are you know, have the most housing available to um, serve residents that need to live in those locations that are adjacent to transit. Glenn? I'm in feeling uh, inclined to move for a close to discussion and uh, take a vote. Anybody with me? Second that. Second. I totally agree. Pressa, you're on mute if you're talking. Okay. Um, we had a move to vote from Glenn, a second from Marty Tangoro, I believe. <laughs> Any discussion on the vote? Um, I'll I second. Would... We have a second. We have a second. Uh, I, yeah. I would like to hear. I see we have a couple of people with hands up. I'd be interested to hear uh, Marianne and Patrick's questions. Uh, since Marty's seconded, I assume he's good with moving to question without. Uh, but I'm happy to be overridden. I would like to keep the discussion briefer. Okay. Briefly, uh, Marianne first. You're muted. Uh, yep. Thank you. Um, I, Jackson, I know you're an urban planner by, by trade and uh, densification is a big issue and it, it helps. Um, but what I would just caution is we've got a lot of projects in progress or already approved. Atlanta um, is a very dense area. It has a population density. Um, I know one of my neighbors always tells me, oh, it's similar to Calcutta because she's looked up the statistics. Um, and uh, we, we are about to double in size based on the new units that are going to be added. So I do value um, our new neighbors that are coming in, um, but I feel like in where we are now, we need to, to pause and reflect on uh, what is gonna be a new, um, more dense, more transit oriented, hopefully neighborhood for us and, and make sure that we, we haven't gone too far. So in my day job, which I rarely talk about, I'm an energy efficiency professional. Um, and when we are adding these new um, buildings, I do worry about grid stability in addition to um, all of the benefits that densification can have. So I just wanna acknowledge your expertise. I know that you're part of the development partners as well, um, but, and, and agree with your, your general principles, but we, we'd like uh, just a little bit of reflection on on the developments that are going in, um, and then we'll re relook at the demand. Thank you, Patrick. Can I respond to that real quick, Tressa. Oh, okay. 
Uh, just real quick. Oh, yeah. Um, so all of the comments I'm making tonight are from comments that residents within Clarendon Park have responded to on our surveys. Um, and I would be happy to share those with you, Marianne. That that would be great. We should definitely so, talk about our yeah. collection processes. Thank so while, you. I, so while it sounds like it's my opinion as an urban planner, it's the opinion of um, the majority of people within Clarendon Park. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. So I just think we're going around in circles here. I just want to close this off. So okay, I was actually just going to Patrick Nagel to see how. Oh, sorry. Gonna... That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry, we had a couple of Patricks. My fault. Okay. So yeah, I, I am prepared to uh, to take a vote. I would just, you know, just as a as a reminder and caution to people, we've been for those of us been on this panel for a long time. You know, over the last decade plus, we voted on a lot of proposals. Um, there's always like a better idea out there for what could be someplace but the reality oftentimes is juxtaposed with with sort of the vision of 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 sort of what we might want uh, even tonight if you asked everybody what the ideal building is you would be all over the place like there were people who want just you know so many different options you can't make everybody happy but i think what we have is a parking lot it's been there for 65 years for a hospital that's not fully utilized attached to a medical center, which is also pretty much underutilized uh, in an area where, um, you know, we have an opportunity for development. And uh, I just think people should take that into consideration. Yeah, I suppose in an ideal world, there'd be this perfect, you know, brand new hospital building built there. But it seems to me that, you know, we have a hospital who's willing to sell this parcel and take the money from the parcel and dump it back into the hospital to make the hospital better while a developer is willing to give, you know, three million plus dollars to Sarah Circle. So I think on, on many levels, it's sort of a realistic win-win as opposed to an idealistic win or loss. So that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, end of discussion. Um, I guess we're moving to vote. All right. Um, I'm going to call off names and please um, say out loud uh, your vote. And this vote is uh, yes to um, to um, sorry <laughs> change the the PD to amend the PD to allow for this uh, project. Uh, yes is in favor of that. No is against that. Uh, 3600 North Lord, uh, Lakeshore Drive, Douglas Smith. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, 3660 North uh, Lakeshore Drive, Mary. Uh, hi, like uh, like Lake, you know, we're not uh, 3600 as opposed to, we're not really close, but we, tre we tend to go with what the neighborhoods are thinking. And it seems to me that the neighbors are voting no, so we're voting no. Okay. Uh, 3930 Pine Grove, George Caller. No, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see where we're at. 700 West Bittersweet, Alice Leahy. Uh, no. No. Okay. 828 Grace, Patrick Nagel. I'll vote yes. Thank you. Beacon Block Club, Stuart Berman. Have you asked people to unmute? Yes, can you unmute Stuart, please? The problem is it wasn't unmuted. I'm so sorry. They, oh that no. Was, that was a Zoom issue. I was hitting it about six times. Uh, we are in favor, so we are voting yes. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Buena Park Neighbors, Alex Walking. Yes. Okay. Um, Clarendon Park Neighbors, Jackson Morsey. Yes. Thank you. Um, Clark Street Block Club, Alan. Are you on? I'm going to abstain. Okay. Um, historic structures, Marty Tangora. No. 
Lakeside area neighbors, Marianne Lalonde. No. Lakeview East, oh, she's not here. Let's see. Uh, Magnolia Malden, Kathy Cook. We're supporting Lana and voting no. Okay. Um, Mark Zipper, real estate. Yes. Okay. UCC, Patrick Waters. Yes. Um, Truman Square Neighbors, Betsy Lent. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Friendly Towers, Glenn. Uh, no. No. Uh, North Halstead Business Alliance. We vote no. Um, 4250 Marine, Robert Salm. I am authorized to vote yes. Okay. Um, 4300 North Marine, Michael Waltz. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, 4848 North Sheridan, Stuart Hatch. Yes. Yes. Um, 655 West Irving Park, Susie Hunter. We're gonna go with Lana's recommendation and no. Okay. Let's see. Okay, Dover Street Neighbors, Scott Adams. No. No. Okay, East Lake View Neighbors, Michael Zink. No. Okay, um, Grayson Wilson, Jason DeVore. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Nuna, Maria. I'm authorized to vote no. Okay, thank you. Uh, one North Side, Chris White. Uh, our leaders have asked me to vote no. Thank you. Uh, Luke Sauer, retail. Yes. Okay. And Uptown United, Martin Sorge. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, Jackie Taylor. No. No. Um, 3950 North Lakeshore Drive, Anna. No. No. Okay. 3750 North Lakeshore Drive. Bill Cartwright. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and last but not least, uh, Michael Rohrbeck, Voice uh, of the People. No. No. Okay. Let me tally this up. Give me a minute, please. Okay, I have 16 no's and I'll recount to and 15 yeses. Let me double check this. That's what I got. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 
15, 16 no's. And we have one abstention, by the way. Can I move to adjourn? I'm going to finish counting the yeses. 15, 14, 15, yep, 15 yeses. That's correct. The noes have it. All right. Thank you so much again for attending our committee meeting and for sharing your questions and feedback. Um, we will share the link to view this meeting and any other updates on our website. Thank you all and have a wonderful night.